Good morning and welcome to Body of Christ worship today. We're here to worship and honor our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And today being Father's Day, you ought to recognize the Father of all. The Father who sent his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to save us and redeem us back to himself. And the only way to do that was through the kinsman redeemer. And again, I say whose name is Jesus, the Christ. Were it not for him laying his life down, we would not have a way back to God the Father. I'm going to read Psalm 38, or a portion of it. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your wrath, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. For your arrows pierce me deeply, and your hand presses me down. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger, nor any health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My wounds are foul and festering because of my foolishness. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. For my loins are full of inflammation, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and severely broken. I groan because of the turmoil in my heart. Lord, all my desire is before you, and my sighing is not hidden from you. My heart pants. My strength fails me. As for the light of my eyes, it also has gone from me. My loved ones and my friends stand aloof from my plague, and my relatives stand afar off. Those also who seek my life lay snares for me. Those who seek my hurt speak destruction and plan deceptions all the day long. But I, like a deaf man, do not hear. I am like a mute who does not open his mouth. Thus, I am like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth is no response. For in you, O Lord, I hope. You will hear, O Lord my God, for I said, hear me, lest they rejoice over me. Lest when my foot slips, they exalt themselves against me. For I am ready to fall, and my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare my iniquity. I will be in my anguish over my sin. But my enemies are vigorous and they are strong, and those who hate me wrongfully have multiplied. Those also who rendered evil for good, they are my adversaries because I follow that which is good. I'm gonna stop right there. This is talking about doing the good things for the cause of God, and the God that you follow, but understand, there are people going to be standing against you, willing to go against you, willing to take any type of measure against you when you're standing for God. For when you take a firm stand for God, understand you will have enemies. Understand you will have adversaries. Why? 
Because friendship with the world is enmity, it's separation, it's a gulf between that and living for God. We're here to worship today. We're here to praise God. We're here to lift him up. Why? Because he is worthy. Let us pray and prepare ourselves to worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to come into your house of worship. We thank you for being the God of our salvation, the God who we exalt because you are on high. Lord, we just thank you for lifting us up when we're down, for showing us the way into light when we try to walk into darkness, for uplifting our souls when we're down. And when people talk about us, we know you prepare a table before our enemies. And you will make our enemies our footstools. Lord, we thank you as we go into a spirit of worship so that we sing the songs of Zion and in unity worship the God who is the truth. Lord, we just thank you and praise you and ask that you would take your manservant that you place as the shepherd of this flock and take him down into your bosom and bless him and his household as you've done in the past and you will continually do so that he will bless us with your word. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. And we bless your holy name. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. And now the praise team. Glory. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Forever you are the we worship and adore you. We bow ourselves before you, giving you the glory that is due your name. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Glory and adore you we bow ourselves before you giving you the glory that is due we your magnify. name we magnify your name glorify glorify your name oh God oh God We magnify your name. Glorify. Glorify your name. God. Oh God. We magnify. We magnify your name.
God is. Yes. Ooh, he's my all and all. God. God, God is Ooh, He's my all and all
Come on. Right here. It's time. Come on. It's time to give God all of the praise. Doing all you know to do God has not forgotten you Oh, 
open doors for you. Sing it again. Sing it again. When you can't see your way. And you feel that you have gone astray Doing all you know to do scripture reading uh, right on through many of the songs that have been sung this morning. The theme is faith. Amen. Trusting God. Believing God. I, I like the way that uh, Hawkins wrote that song. He said God will open doors. God can open doors. Doesn't mean he's going to always do it the way that I want it done. Doesn't mean that he's going to do it because I want it done. But God can do it. Yeah, praise the Lord. Uh, uh, again, uh, I have this, this great joy and great privilege to find out what the praise team is going to sing uh, most Sunday mornings because I'm on their, their text thread. And so when they say what songs they're going to sing, 
I get an opportunity to come here and load those songs so that they can have the lyrics. And I'll sit here for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, just listen to those songs over and over and over again. And then to hear it live, sung on Sunday morning, I uh, get a chance to worship uh, corporately with you guys because I'll, I'll be having worship by myself while I'm in here doing that. And praise the Lord. And we ought to worship the Lord. Amen. Amen. We ought to be able to praise the Lord, not just on Sunday morning. You ever been in your car and you get at the stop sign and, and, and your song comes on the radio? You know, the Lord just done brought you through something. And that's I mean, next thing you know, it's like two or three stop lights later. You know, people blowing at you and everything. But that's OK. That's OK. Give God the praise. Give him the glory. You know, it's time to praise the Lord. Amen. At all times. Well, this is a uh, this is a day, a day of a great celebration for many reasons. Um, high school graduates, uh, had, uh, congratulations to you, uh, Jada. Retirement, uh, Ms. Mrs. Jones. Forty years at one school teaching between kindergarten and first grade. And so I don't know if you saw the third generation, but I know you had seen the first and second generation yeah, of, of students there. And then this is Juneteenth, the celebration of the end of slavery here in America. And then finally to all of the fathers in the house, happy Father's Day to you all. Amen. Uh, and, and to see so many men sitting in here. Uh, man, what a blessing, what a blessing. And so, uh, thinking about the sermon that I had preached last week, uh, the question was asked, are we gods? And we looked at um, Romans chapter 4, uh, in particular verse 17, because there's a misinterpretation, thus a misapplication of that verse. And I don't think, uh, I thought that I had not given that some clear, uh, in-depth uh, investigation last week. And then as Sheila and I were talking this week, during the week, she said, I said, it dawned on me, it's Father's Day. <laughs> ah, man. And I, you know, sometimes I don't preach uh, sermons that are relevant to the holiday, but there's something in this passage in the fourth chapter of Romans and it talks about fathers. And so uh, I want to talk about, as the theme has been this morning, faith, yes. trusting God. And Paul identifies in this fourth chapter that Abraham is the father of faith. Now, many people look at Abraham as the father of the Jews. You have the Muslims who look at Abraham as the father of uh, the Muslims. You know, uh, and then many Christians look at him as being the father of Christianity, but the Bible doesn't call him the father of any of those specifically. But we do see what the Bible calls him the father of those who are in the faith. He is the father of the faith. In this fourth chapter of Romans, uh, Paul is in sort of the middle of a discussion about faith, about Abraham, about being a Jew. But most of that had been centered around the fact that Jews took great pride and that the law was given to them and that they were adherents of the law. And so what Abraham is, I mean, what Paul is doing here is, and we're picking up in the middle of his discussion, uh, he, he's, he's showing that Abraham is not just the father of the biological Jew, but he's the father of everyone who has faith. And I don't mean just the simple faith to sit in a chair, the simple faith to walk across the street, but faith in God. He is the father of those who trust God for righteousness. Look with me into the third chapter real quick. We want to back up there and... Um, start at that point and then we will pick up in the fourth chapter. And y'all give me about an hour, I'll be done. <laughs> uh, and y'all say, that's a long time. But you think about the, long, the length of time that you use, you take while you sitting there with your phone. <laughs> uh, oh, scrolling Facebook. 
playing games. How long can you sit and watch a movie? Ah, uh, yeah, Top Gun, chilling. I went to go see Top Gun a couple of weeks ago. That was a good movie, but it was about two hours, a little bit over two hours long, and I enjoyed every minute of it. So let's enjoy the word of the Lord, amen? amen. But, but I, won't, I won't take the whole hour, maybe just 59 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Kenny. Kenny said, take my time. Uh, I, guess, I guess because because Elder George ain't here, somebody had to say it. <laughs> Let's look at Romans chapter 3, starting at verse 27. Romans 3, 27. And so again, Paul is talking about boasting. He's talking about pride in Jewish, Jewish heritage. So he asked this question, where then is boasting? And then he answers this question, it is excluded. By what kind of law? By one of works? No, on the contrary, by the law of faith. For we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God for Jews only? Is he not also for Gentiles? Yes, for Gentiles too. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then cancel the law through faith? Absolutely not. On the contrary, we uphold the law. And so Paul is saying to them that it is more than the law. You can't just please God by keeping the law. There are those who will tell you that we are wrong by worshiping on Sundays because we are not worshiping on Saturday. We are not worshiping on the Sabbath. We are breaking the law. But do we have faith in God? Is there faith in Christ Jesus? And so in this fourth chapter, as we get into it, I want to try to look at five things very briefly. I'm not going to break down this doctrine of, uh, of justification with all the technicalities that you see uh, from theologians, I just want to hit a few points. For us as fathers, fathers, know that uh, Christian fathers, know that you are in the faith, and then also as a father that's in the faith because of our father Abraham, you should live a faithful life. Present that before your children, and then also pass that faith on. So five things that we want to look at very quickly that righteousness is declared uh, uh, and justified by faith rather than works. Sin is covered apart from any kind of affiliation and, a tr and tradition. God's promise is received through righteousness by faith rather than the law. God can give life where there is no evidence of life. God can do that. Uh, faith in God should be passed on. Let's pray and then let's uh, look at this passage very briefly. Father, we thank you for who you are. And Lord, thank you for the many celebration reasons for this day. But none is greater than to celebrate you and to worship you. Thank you for life, life through Jesus Christ. Thank you for your word. And as we look into your word, open it up to us that we might apply it to our lives and not just apply it to our lives, but share it with others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Number one, Abraham declared righteous and he was justified by faith instead of his works. Let's look at Romans 4, 1. What then can we say that Abraham, Paul is continuing on, our physical ancestor has found? You know, since he previously said it's not through works. If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to brag about. Yeah, he could, if it was just a matter of works, he could brag about that. But what does Paul go on to say here? But not before God. <laughs> you can brag all you want to, but it's not going to be before God. It's not going to be uh, to your advantage before God. For what does the scripture say? And I like how Paul does this. And you can, throughout this passage, he appeals to scripture over and over again. And when we talk about God, when we talk about the things of God, when we talk ab about, to people about life, as believers, we ought to be giving them scriptural principles. Not my opinion, 
but scriptural principles. And Paul gives them scriptural principles, actually literal scripture here, to make his argument. People can argue with me all day long and they might win. But you're never going to win against the word of God. And I don't have to argue with the word of God, with the word of God. I just give it to you. And now I let the Holy Spirit do his work. Let, let, uh, Q and I were talking this week and I, I think that was one of the part of the uh, conversation that he and I had was just put the word out there and let the word do the work. Yeah. Don't worry about the results. Let the word do the work. So he says, for what does the scripture say? This is what the scripture says. He says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. Those of you, Paul said, who want to just hang on to your uh, Jewishness and you want to hold on to the law. Notice, he says, notice that Abraham, because of what the scripture says, that he believed God. And then it was credited to him as righteousness. He uses several words here, and I want to uh, not in insult your intelligence, but just to give you, if you did not know, the definition of those words as they apply to us as believers. He says, Abraham was justified. It's the Greek word that means to put right. It's the Greek word that means to show right. And then it also has this idea of being a judicial act. Now, it's the judicial act of vindicating one as having complied with the requirements of the law. And in Abraham's case, it was the law of God. He was justified by God and God vindicated him. God has also vindicated us because of our faith in Jesus Christ. It says Abraham believed God. <sighs> this may go against some of the things that we have been taught for years and that even I taught for years. But the word belief from the Greek deals with your mind. We always want to say it's the heart. It's not just your emotions. Matter of fact, your emotions are going to do what? Betray you. Some days I like the Redskins. Other days I hate the Redskins. Every day I hate the Cowboys. And so, and so, so, and so feelings are fickle. Emotions are fickle. I'm so glad that Golden State beat the Celtics. Because I don't like the Celtics either. If the Cowboys or the Celtics were playing the Russians right now, I might be rooting for the Russians. <laughs> That's just how I feel. Uh, but when it comes to faith, it's a mind thing. I might switch if they're playing the Russians because the Russians are enemies of our country. <laughs> It's kind of hard to go against your countrymen, isn't it? But, you know, I, I might have to weigh that every now and then. Abraham believed God. You, you think that things are true. It's a matter of your mind. Your mind has to wrap itself around what you see to be true and then to put your trust in it. That's faith. That's faith. Think that it's true. Your heart can't think. Your physical heart can't think. Your emotional heart acts upon what your brain, what your mind thinks. How many of us have thought the wrong thing about somebody? How many of us hate it when people think the wrong things about us? You don't know me. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. It was charged to his account. It, 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 it was put on his account, it uh, was attributed as an asset to him. Wow. When we believe God, God takes our faith and he attributes that, he puts that on our account. It's an asset. And if you know anything about basic bookkeeping, you have assets, and liabilities. You have pluses and you have minuses. And some of us have been where our credit looked toe up. Can't even say from the floor up because it was still on the floor. 
But how did we feel that when we got a bill from Virginian Power or we got a bill from the gas company and they said, you got a credit? Didn't it look good to see that little minus sign right there? Good. I mean, that, oh, I don't have to pay them this month. Because they credited my account. God credited Abraham's account. And he has credited our account if we believe in him. We know who God is. We trust him for who he is. And he puts to our account righteousness. What is righteousness? It's the status that satisfies the moral requirements of God. The, the status that satisfies the moral requirements of God. Look at verse 4. Paul makes this practical. He says, now to the one who works, pay is not considered as a gift, but as something owed. When I was working, first job, we got paid every week. Went to work on Monday, looked for a paycheck on Friday. When I went to the Navy Yard, got paid every two weeks. Went to work on Monday. And either a Thursday or Friday, two weeks later, I expected my, it wasn't a gift, I put in my hours. The expectation was, I come to work, I give you eight for eight, and you're now going to give me 80 hours worth of pay. That was what you owed me. Look at verse five. But to, one, but to the one who does not work, uh-oh. Now, he, now, let me finish the sentence. But to the one who does not work but believes on him who declares the ungodly to be righteous, his faith is credited for righteousness. Now, when I stop right there to the one who does not work, where did your mind go? Where did your mind go? <laughs> if a man don't work, a man don't eat. And some of us, we know we, we worked with some co-workers who don't do much of anything. And they get the same pay at the end of that pay period as we get. But that's not what Paul is talking about here. Paul says, but for the one who does not work but believes on him, who declares, who pronounces a verdict that someone is in full accordance with the requirements of the law. The justification was, uh, uh, first, it was how, what now, where you have been vindicated. Now, Paul says the declaration of God is that he said, now that you're vindicated, I also declare you to be innocent. Aren't you glad about that? That you've met all the requirements of the law? God did that. It wasn't an act of ours. We just believed on God. And God says, now I'm going to make you innocent. Now, oh, that ought to make you say hallelujah. Look at verse 6. Paul now is going to between verses 6 through 12, he's going to let us know that our sin is, a, is forgiven and that our sin is forgiven apart from family affiliations and traditions. Even though we are not the biological children of Abraham, God still forgives our sin. I don't know too many folk in this room that may be able to claim Jewish heritage. But as Paul goes throughout this discussion through uh, chapters uh, five and six, he lets them know that their Jewish heritage really doesn't account for much of anything unless they believe in God. Look at verse six. Likewise, David also speaks of the blessing of the man God credits righteousness to apart from works. And he's quoting from Psalm 32 here. He says, how joyful are those whose lawful acts are forgiven, whose lawful acts, uh, uh, lawless acts, I'm sorry, are forgiven. They're dismissed. They have a debt that's canceled. And he says, whose sins are covered. How joyful is the man the Lord will never charge with sin. We believe in God. We trust in Jesus Christ. We will never be charged with sin. Because we believe in the God of heaven and we ought to be happy about it. How joyful. Verse nine says, is this blessing only for the circumcised there? So now Paul brings it back to talk to those Jews to whom he's writing there at Rome. He said, is it for the circumcised then or is it also for the uncircumcised? Jews took great pride in the fact that they had their foreskins cut off and that identified them. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And that, that identified them with Yahweh, the God of heaven. They took pride in what their family afforded them, what their body afforded them. 
what their nationality and heritage and ethnicity afforded them. Paul says, is it also for the uncircumcised? For we say faith was credited to Abraham for righteousness. He goes back to that. It was given to Abraham because of righteousness. In what way then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while he was circumcised, but uncircumcised. He believed God when he was in Ur of the Chaldees. And God had been saying to him, Abraham, get up and go. At age 75, he got up and he went. And he went to a place that was undisclosed. God didn't tell him where he was going. God just said, get up and go, and I'm a good, I want you to go to a place that I will show you. That's faith, y'all. That's trust. Go to, how many of you go somewhere and you want directions? <laughs> Not even directions, you want a destination. Remember being a kid? Where we going, Daddy? Where we going, Mama? And I, when my boys used to ask, they said, just, just, just ride with me. You in the car with me. Doesn't matter where we going. You are with me. And God was saying to Abraham, don't, it doesn't matter where you're going, you are with me. You've trusted me, you believe in me, you've answered my call, just, just go with me. And he did that before he was circumcised. Verse 11 says, he received the sign, he received this visual cue, a clue of circumcision as a seal. It was a confirmation, it was proof, it was authentication of the righteousness that he had by faith when? While still uncircumcised. He wasn't a church member yet. But he believed in God. He hadn't been baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost and that with a mighty burning fire yet. Come on now. But he believed in God. He hadn't shaken the preacher's hand yet. But he believed in God. He, he hadn't been on the usher board or the singing in the choir yet, but he believed in God. And God gave him the credit. He put an asset on his account because he believed in God. Now, the, the confirmation of that asset, the confirmation for Abraham and his descendants was circumcision. Notice what the latter part of verse 13 says. This was to make him the father of all who believe, but are not what? Circumcised. I don't have to be circumcised. I don't have to be a Jew to have God accredit to me righteousness. And so it, it was, uh, but he was, he's the father of all who believe, but are not circumcised so that the righteousness may be credited to them also. And he became the father of the circumcised who are not only circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of our father Abraham while he was still uncircumcised. Follow. Fathers, we've heard this said so many times that our children are a chip off of the old block. They act just like you. They look like you. They talk like you. Uh, my, my, my daughter in love says, you and your son are just alike. <laughs> you say again and he says again. <laughs> huh? He's a chip off the old block. Now don't go there and say, yeah, off the block head. That's not what we're talking about. That, 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 that's, that, that's not what we're talking about. But I am glad that my sons have followed me, not as one who works in Norfolk Naval Shipyard like I did. I'm, that, that, that doesn't impress me. I'm glad he's got a job. What impressed me, he got a job. <laughs> he's taking care of his family. He's following me because he's following my footsteps. He's seen how I took care of his mama and them. He's followed in those footsteps of being responsible. My other son has followed in those footsteps of being responsible. But most importantly, they have followed in the footsteps of making a decision to follow Jesus Christ for themselves. Now, I set the environment. 
I set the plate for them, but they had to choose that on their own. And I see how they are setting that environment, how they are setting the plate for their children to choose Jesus on their own. Yeah, for those who follow in his footsteps, those who imitate. Yeah, um, uh, one of my granddaughters was telling me the other day that uh, she stepped out of the bathroom, had some soap on her face, and she said, I'm Pop Pop. But I, that ain't the end of it. She got deep. She said, now turn with me to Psalms. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. I mean, I was done. Uh, I, I'm glad she's imitating. I'm glad she's imitating righteousness. I have got to give the example of righteousness before her for her to follow and imitate those steps. Are we imitating the steps of Jesus Christ? We say we follow him. We say we believe him. But then are we following him? What does Jesus say? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Number three. Number three. God's promise is received through, un, uh, though, uh, I'm sorry. God's promise is received though righteousness, through righteousness by faith rather than by the law. Look at verse 13. For the promise of Abraham or to his descendants that he would inherit the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness that comes by what? Faith. For those who are of the law are heirs. Faith is made empty and the promise, the promise is an agreement, a verbal agreement by one person. He says, if it's by law, then it is canceled, it's abolished. Why? You just seem like, well, maybe we ought to follow the law. But Paul explains it's, it's, we ought not to be following the law just to follow the law because the law produces wrath. The law produces punishment. The law produces anger. God's punishment is on those who break the law. That's not righteousness. It's right that God punishes the law, but we are not righteous when we break the law. Our faith in God is not because or through the law. It's because God has loved us. Paul says, and where there is no law, there is transgression and overstepping. There is disobedience. You got to have the law because you have, need to know what's right and what's wrong. But when we believe in God, God gives us his righteousness. So now he looks at us and he sees sin no more. Look at verse 16. This is why the promise is by faith, so that it may be according to grace to guarantee it to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of what? Abraham's faith. He is the father of us all in God's sight. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. Let's go down to verse, uh, that's uh, the first part of verse 17. And the second part of verse 17 is here, is that he believed in God. We go back to that faith again, right? Mm -hmm. He believed in God. And now listen to Paul's description of God, who gives life to the dead and calls things into existence that do not exist. Mm -hmm. Now, who's calling things into existence? <laughs> It wasn't Abraham. It's God. God, Abraham believed in God. God who calls things into existence that don't exist. Now, I dealt with this a little bit last week, but God, God, God is the one who speaks things into existence. Abraham believed God and God gave, put that belief on his account for righteousness. And Abraham had enough sense that in his righteousness that God had given him to know that Abraham could not call anything into existence. Abraham knew that it was God. He believed in God who calls things into existence. Look at the next verse. Look at verse 18. This, this is, I used to say this all the time when I was a kid. He believed Hoping against hope. 
<laughs> hoping against hope. You're like, that's, how do you hope against hope? I used to say it all the time as a kid, but I didn't know what it meant. I just said it because it sounded so good. Hope is what? Hope is this expectation. It's a general feeling that some desire will be fulfilled. So Abraham had this feeling that something was going to be this desire that he had. He wanted a son. Every Jewish man during that time wanted a son, wanted to pass their name on. But Abraham was at the time when the Lord came and visited him. He was like 99 years old. And his wife was 90 years old. He had a son, Ishmael, but Ishmael wasn't the son of promise. He was a son of them following the traditions of the time rather than doing what God had commanded him to do. Wait on me. I'm going to make you father of many nations. So he believed hoping against hope. So that he became the father of many nations according to what had been spoken. So will be your descendants. Now watch this thing. I, th these verses, these next verses, uh, they just keep getting me excited. <laughs> he considered, Abraham considered his own body to be already dead. Since, it was, since he was about 100 years old. <laughs> and he also considered the deadness of Sarah's womb. But notice the next phrase, without weakening in the faith. He did not waver in unbelief at God's promise, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God because he was fully convinced that what he, God, had promised, God was able to perform. Now can I read those verses again and just give you a little bit of insight? He, he, he was hoping against hope. He had this expectation that this desire would be filled even though he didn't see it yet. He considered, he, he, he saw the reality, he contemplated, he knew for sure. He understood completely <laughs> that I'm 99 years old. I don't know too many men around me 99 years old. Than making babies. <laughs> he may have been saying, I don't know if I can do what it takes to make a baby. I'm 90 years old. The plumbing don't work like it used to. He, he, he knew. He knew what nature dictated. He knew what he saw. He knew what he was experiencing. That's why we can't always put bank into our experiences. We need to trust God. He knew his own body was dead. And he also considered, he, he also contemplated, he thought about the, the, the deadness of Sarah's womb. And here's the thing that got me. It says the deadness of her womb. A dead womb can't hold a fetus. He said, he considered, he, he, he saw, I hear what God is saying. I know what my body ain't doing. And I certainly know what she ain't doing. Now, I don't know how they got together at 99 and 90. But somehow, I don't know if she cooked his favorite meal. I don't know if she rubbed his head, but somehow or another, they came together based upon the promise of God. I see what I see. I know what I know. I feel what I feel. But it's not weakening my faith. It's not making it of non effect. It's, it's not sick. I'm not sick. My faith is not weak. It's not feeble. And neither am I wavering. God said it. I know what I see. We know what we see. Reality is in front of us. Life is in front of us. Our experiences we have. But what has God said? He didn't let that cause doubt. It didn't let, he didn't let that cause dispute. He just saw what was there. He didn't let that cause uncertainty in him. 
What has God promised to you? How many of y'all seen heaven? How many of y'all seen Jesus? How many of y'all have seen God? But you know what? His word promises us that where he is, <laughs> we're going to be with him. That's hope. That's expectation. I've never seen heaven. I've never seen the pearly gates. I don't know Abraham if he walked in this room this moment. But I know he's a father of faith because the Bible says so. My faith is predicated upon his faith because he believed God and it was credited him for righteousness. And now I believe God. I've got the record book here that tells me how God has operated throughout the ages. And so what he has promised, what he's promised, he's able also to perform. He can bring it to pass because I've seen the record and we've got scientific proof that what's in this book, <laughs> there's scientific proof of the flood. There was scientific proof for years. They didn't, they didn't think that the walls of Jericho could come tumbling straight down. But when they did the excavation, they noticed that the way that those uh, stones had fallen, they didn't fall inside, they didn't fall outside. There was no explosion. Science proved that those, that those walls came straight down. Whatever God has promised, he's able also to perform. He can make it happen. He can bring it to pass. So I've never seen the pearly gates. I know that there's some streets of gold somewhere. <laughs> I know that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. I know that sin is going to be eradicated one day. That's my expectation. I won't have to worry about city council folks sitting there fussing and cussing at each other. I, I, I won't have to worry about them firing folk and hiring somebody else. I don't have to worry about none of that politics stuff. Because there's going to be a day when I'm going to be with my Savior. And it tells me that the tree of life will be there. Uh, and, and that the leaves of the tree are good for the healing of the nations. There won't be any more war. That's my expectation. And whatever God has promised, he's able. He's got the strength. He's got the power to perform it. And he don't have to perform it, like I said earlier, the way I want him to do it. Because he's God. And I am his slave. Let's close this out. It is less than an hour. Verse 22, Paul goes on to say, therefore, since it was credited to him, to Abraham for righteousness, now it was credited to him, was not written for Abraham alone. You know, he says that which was written wasn't written for Abraham by himself, but for us also. It will be credited to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. I believe that. I believe that the God who spoke to Abraham is the same God that rose Jesus from the dead. I believe that the God that spoke to Abraham is the same one who sent an angel to speak to Mary and says, the child that you're going to have, he will save his people from his sin. I believe that Abraham believed the angel and said, be it unto me. Though I do have a question. Hold on for a second here. How is that going to happen? Because I've never known a man. Don't worry about it. Because the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And that which will be in you will be holy. He will be God with us. I believe that. I believe that that child that she had grew up to be an adult man. And he performed miracles. 
And the greatest miracle was that he went to the cross, gave himself as a sacrifice, as a substitute for me to satisfy God. And I believe that when he died, and I believe he showed up died, he didn't just swoon. He didn't just faint. He didn't have an episode. He didn't have a moment of the, fe uh, of the fevers uh, or the vapors. He was dead for three days in the grave. And then he got up. He rose from the grave. And then there were over 500 folk that saw him. So we got a record that he got up. I believe that he ascended into heaven. I believe that he sent back the Holy Spirit to give us power. I believe, I believe, I believe. It wasn't just for Abraham, this faith. This faith is for all of us. I believe, as Paul says in the 25th verse of this fourth chapter of Romans, that the one whom God raised from the dead was delivered up for our trespasses and he was raised for our justification. He was, he was delivered for our disobedience but he was also raised for our justification. Where God now looks at the record and because he's applied his righteousness to my record, he stamped it clean. You, you've seen those ledger sheets where you've got all these entries, you have your credits and your debits and some of our checkbooks, we got more debits than we do have credits. Some people used to write checks you used to write checks, but well, I still got checks left. That means I still got money in the bank. No, baby, no, 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 no. That ain't, that ain't, that ain't the way it works. Now, when we were in, what was it, Shilla, fourth, fifth grade, they taught us, they taught us how to write checks. They taught us how to balance a checkbook. That was part of our math work when we were in, in school. I don't understand how somebody of our generation could think that just because you got more checks, that means you got more money. Maybe they didn't pay attention in that classroom that, during that math lesson. But God has given us his righteousness for all of those debits that we had. All of those deficits that we have on our ledger. He's wiped them out. He didn't ask us for anything other than to what? Believe in him. We used to put so much emphasis on making someone get up and come walk the aisle. That's not in the Bible. Believe in Jesus. Now, you got to understand that this belief in Jesus is you got to believe what he did for you. And now you've got to commit to him. That's part of belief. That's another part of that word, pistis, faith. You've got to commit to him. And when you commit to him, you do what he says. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for Abraham being the father of the faith, being the father of the faithful. Thank you that you sent Jesus Christ to die on Calvary's cross to take away our sin debt. And you have declared us righteous. You vindicated us and you made that judicious act now where you have also said you are indeed innocent. The debt is paid. I pray, oh God, that as fathers and uh, believers in general, that we would live a life that brings honor to you because of your righteousness, that our children and our children's children and those around us will see the value of having God take away the debits from their accounts. I pray, Lord, if one doesn't know you, that he or she would come to know you as Savior and as Lord and commit their lives to you. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise team is coming back. And they are going to sing again. Happy Father's Day to you all. I'm not sure what they're going to sing, but they're going to sing something.
my soul When the battle was against me And your promises you care That your word will set me free If I just keep my mind on thee You will keep me in perfect peace You are my peace You are my peace You are my peace And I worship thee You are my peace You are From the snare of the enemy In the midst of my storm You held and protected me If I just keep my mind on thee You will keep me in perfect You